doing the introduction today is Dr. Patricia Pavier. Dr. Pavier is the group leader of the Radiological Materials Group at Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. She's also the chair of the Gen 4 International Forum Education and Training Working Group. Patricia. Thank you so much, uh, Bertrand. Good morning, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to have uh, with us today Dr. Nathalie Chauvin. She's working at the French Alternative Energy and Atomic Energy Commission, the CEA, Cadarache Irene, in the fuel study department, international experts on fuels for fast reactor. She worked for a long time on the minor actinide transmutation program, participating to the optimization of the fuel design, the irradiation experiments, and the synthesis report. Then, she was project manager for the development of a very innovative fuels for the gas cool fast reactor with oxide carbide fuels, refactory cladding, including ceramic composites, one four pin or plate tab fuel elements. She's now in charge of various international corporations devoted to fast reactor fuel development. She's also participating in several activities in different scientific committees of international conferences, such as IEMPT, Fast Reactor, and Global, and she's the CEA counterpart in several bilateral collaborations with other international scientific organizations devoted to the MOX fuel. So without any delay, I'm very happy to have Nathalie uh, today presenting. So I give you the floor, Nathalie. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Patricia, and thank you, uh, Bertrand. Uh, good morning or good afternoon, uh, everybody. Uh, I have the pleasure today uh, to present uh, all the activities uh, on the MOX fuel for advanced reactor. So, I'm trying to move to the next slide. Okay, thank you. So within the Gen4 initiative, uh, several reactors have been selected. Uh, sodium fast reactor, a safran, uh, lead or lead business fast reactor, uh, the alafran, uh, advanced driver system, uh, ADS, and gas fast reactor, GF4. Uh, we have also very high temperature reactor, the HTR, and molten salt reactor, MSO. Uh, innovative fuels have been selected, especially for the fast neutron reactors, uh, and it's mainly uh, ceramics like uh, mixed oxide, uh, mixed nitride, uh, mixed carbide, and also uh, metal fuel, uh, like uh, UPUZDR. Uh, so, uh, if we are uh, regarding to uh, the operating conditions, okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, now some details about the conditions of use uh, in these fast reactors. Uh, we want to reach a quite high linear heat rate of 400 to 500 watt per centimeter, especially for seen for the SFO, uh, but it could be lower for the other systems like uh, the GFO or LFO. Uh, the fuel temperature is in between 600 to 2400 degrees, and this is the main difference uh, with the light water reactors, where the fuel temperature remains below 1000 degrees. Another difference uh, is a very high uh, burn-up that we want to reach, um, uh, an average of uh, 13 atom percent, but we want to go to uh, 15. Uh, the residen residence time is also uh, very high with a 800 equivalent full power day, and this corresponds to uh, a dose on the cladding of more than 130 dPa. 
the DPA is displacement per atom, which is uh, the scale for the evaluation of damage on the cladding. So now if we are moving uh, to uh, the criteria for the choice of materials, So the criteria for fuel materials choice are density in fissile atom, a high thermal conductivity as well as a high melting temperature in order to have a high ma margin to melt. A high thermal stability is required in order to avoid phase transitions or dissociation at low temperatures. It's very important in every, um, it's a very important uh, in every situation to avoid, as far as possible, uh, the fuel melting for safety uh, reasons. Uh, high mechanical stability is also uh, relevant uh, with an isotropic expansion as well as a radiation resistance. Uh, the chemical compatibility of the fuel with the cladding is very important in order to prevent from a material damage because the clad acts as the first safety barrier. The reaction with the coolant should be acceptable in order to avoid any energetic strong reaction. The performances for the evaluation are focused on the capability to reach high burn-up and the flexibility towards various operating conditions. This means, for example, the ability to operate at lower power or lower temperature ranges. Secondly, the behavior in case of transients up to severe accidents are the most important factors to take into account. And, uh, and in the case of the closed fuse cycle, the ability to manage the plutonium or to burn minor actinide is, is also very important. And finally, the cost of fabrication and reprocessing is relevant toward uh, the performances. So here is the content of my presentation. It's very long to move from one slide to, to the, the next one. Bertha, maybe you can help me. So the content of my presentation is, uh, first we will start with an overview of the main characteristics of the oxide fuel uh, for fast reactors with the properties before and during irrigation. A comparison with the other fuel uh, for innovative reactors will be presented. Uh, we will have a, a, a very uh, quick overview of the different uh, families and design of fuel and fuel element uh, with a, a very short descri description. Uh, the second part will be devoted uh, to the fuel behavior and the radiation uh, with the main features of the thermal and mechanical behavior uh, with in parallel the evolution of microstructure. In the third part, we will have an overview of the performances reached, uh, the improvement of the design and the, the qualification. So let's start with the main features of the oxide, uh, mixed oxide fuel for advanced reactors. So the Okay, the mix oxide of uranium and plutonium has a phase-centered cubic structure, FCC, uh, with a fluorite uh, type. The substitution of uranium by plutonium uh, is possible until, until uh, 100%. Y defines uh, the plutonium content and the deviation from the stoichiometry uh, is noted uh, X. When X is negative, it means 
that uh, we have oxygen vacancies or actinide interstitials, and it's uh, most of the time uh, the case uh, for MOX fuel. Natalie, so now, let me, please, for just one minute, I apologize. Let's, because you have such a delay on your side, on your side, seeing the slides advance. Um, let me, let me make sure that we're on the slide that you're actually talking to, because I think that the visual is one slide ahead of you. Um, so, and then I will, uh, I will say to, if you'll tell me the title of the slide, I will, I will advance for you. And then, um, I think the general. Yes. The general portion of the audience will see the slide that you're talking to. It may be delayed on your side. So right now, I see slide 10, mixed oxides, uranium and plutonium oxides. That's one, no, that's one in advance of what you're discussing, correct? So, so just before, uh, please, uh, the slide 9. And then I will ask you to, uh, uh, to move to the next slide. Yes, so we're on MOX fuel, so MOX structure, and fabrication. Yes, before. Yes, please. Yes. Okay, slide nine. Slide nine, yes. I so I have So I have no time to present all the fabrication processes available for the MOX pilot fabrication. I just want to uh, illustrate the different microstructures obtained. So a microstructure is defined by the density, the grand size, the porosity shape, and the size of pores. So I've, I've chosen three cases. Yes, three cases. Uh, on the left side, we have the Japanese MOX fuels fabricated with a standard powder metallurgy process, uh, with, uh, but with the poor formers that leads to large grains and large pore diameter. In the center, we have uh, our French industrial coca process based on powder melting uh, that leads to a very homogeneous MOX fuel with a single phase. And on the right side, a more innovative process based on the internal jellifications called sol gel that avoid powder melting and uh, associated the dust uh, with also very good homogeneity. Uh, a standard MOX fuel has a density of more uh, than 95% uh, and a stoichiometry of around 1.97 to 1.98. So next slide, please. So now some exp explanation of the phase diagram. Slide 10 is showing. Okay, because I, I have nine uh, on my screen. Okay, thank you. So uh, it was mentioning that the system UPUO for high content of plutonium appears more complex than initially reported. Indeed, the ternary phase diagram UPUO has recently been revisited. Uh, these references describe the status on this phase diagram. I will try to explain uh, in a simple manner. So at low temperature, uh, before 1,100 Kelvin, uh, here you can see that um, we have a phase diagram like this. This one for was, was uh, provided for uh, 300 Kelvin. And uh, on this phase diagram, you can see uh, just behind uh, the red line uh, between uh, 1.98 of stoichiometry uh, until 2, we have a single phase, uh, FCC phase. Uh, if the stoichiometry is lower than 1.98, uh, then it depends on the plutonium content. For a plutonium content higher than 18%, uh, the blue area 
uh, and the mix oxide is composed with the two FCC phases, one stoichiometric and one hypostoichiometric. After 53% of plutonium, the pink area, uh, we have a single FCC phase, substoichiometric, in equilibrium with a, a, a cubic center phase or a sesquioxide, M2O3. And in between, there is a gap of miscibility in the violet area, where we have two FCC phases uh, and a CC phase. And uh, for a temperature higher than 1,100 uh, Kelvin, uh, we have a solid solutions uh, with a FCC uh, phase. So this is this was the explanation of the uh, phase diagram. So next slide, please. So here is a list of the properties needed uh, for fuel performance codes. Um, so uh, mainly structural, thermal, and mechanical properties. Um, so mainly a uh, latest parameter, thermal conductivity, melting point. Uh, heat capacity, enthalpy of fusion, emissivity, uh, and so on. I will not explain uh, all these properties. Uh, what we have to notice is uh, the parameters of interest uh, in order to define these properties. Um, it's uh, mainly the temperature, uh, the plutonium content, uh, the O over M ratio, and the porosities or the density. Uh, the grain size, uh, the stress, uh, especially for the mechanical uh, properties, uh, and uh, the burn-up. Uh, the, the, the goal is to validate the laws for each properties uh, with the focused range of all the input parameters. That's the reason why we still need measurements in order to cover this very wide area. So next slide, please. Different uh, fuel materials have been identified to fulfill uh, the requirements, mainly uh, the metal fuel, UPUZDR, the oxide fuel, uh, the MOX, uh, the nitride and the carbide. Uh, we will see how these materials properties matches with uh, the criteria uh, defined. So next slide, please. So the next slide is on the metal fuel. It's quite important to have a very short overview of the other fuels targeted for advanced reactors in order to compare those of the oxide fuel with the other candidates. Regarding the metal fuel, a very short summary of its characteristics. Uh, you have to note a low melting temperature, but a very high thermal conductivity. Another feature of this fuel is a large swelling which requires a large gap with the cladding, optimized to be closed at the end of the life in order to avoid mechanical stress on the cladding. But this large gap acts as a thermal barrier. It's unacceptable because it can lead to fuel melting. So it's solved with a metal bond, uh, the sodium, uh, between the fuel and the clad in order to ensure a better heat transfer. An tactic is also expected between uh, the fuel and the clad, and uh, it uh, requires to reduce the operating temperature. One R&D investigation up to now is to put a liner uh, in the inner part of the clad tube uh, in order to avoid this uh, tactic. So next slide, please, on the carbide. With regards to uh, the carbide fuel, a high thermal conductivity plus a high melting uh, temperature uh, leads to a very high margin to melt. Uh, this is a real advantage compared to all the other fuels. 
However, high swelling and the low thermal creep leads to a large pilot clad gap. The only way to avoid the sodium bond, just like in the uh, metal, uh, uh, metal fuel pin, is to reduce the operating con uh, temperature and to adapt to the pin design. Uh, the disadvantage of the carbide, uh, the disadvantages are mainly related to its reaction with the air, which is called uh, pyrophoricity, and uh, that impacts a manufacturing process, demanding a perfect control of the atmosphere uh, with only inert gases. Uh, the experience on the carbide fuels are much more uh, restricted than for the oxide and metals, and uh, because of this risk of pyrophoricity, it has been discarded in most of the uh, countries. Next slide, please, on the nitride fuel. So the nitride, nitride fuel uh, properties are natively similar to the carbide. The main difference uh, lies in the fact that uh, this fuel requires nitrogen-15 enrichment in order to avoid carbon-14 uh, production, which is a waste. Uh, another important point for the nitride behavior is a possible dissociation at low temperature, around 1,700 uh, degrees, which is 1,000 degrees lower than the melting temperature. So next slide, please. On the oxide fuel, with regard to the uh, mixed oxide fuel, uh, the principal features are low thermal conductivity compensated by high melting temperature. Uh, a special design such as a central hole in the pilot leads to an higher margin to melt, and this allows higher power. Hopefully, uh, this high temperature, above 2,000 degrees, generates a total release of fission gases and thus minimizes the gaseous swelling. Uh, solid swelling is low, a high value compared to the metal and carbide fuels, uh, and the thermal creep is also very efficient at this temperature and therefore reduces the mechanical interaction with the cladding. The low level of swelling makes this pin design quite easy. The pilot clad gap is reasonable and the, fill, the, and the pin is filled uh, with helium. So next slide, please. I've chosen to present two properties on the oxide because I have no time to have an overview of all uh, the properties. So I have chosen the melting temperature and the thermal conductivity. So let's start with the melting temperature. Uh, you can see on the figure that uh, the most recent measurements achieved uh, in Japan and also in GRC Karlsruhe are quite uh, spread. Uh, we have recently uh, confirmed the solidus for the 25% of plutonium with a value of uh, 3,040 Kelvin. We expect uh, a minimum uh, around 70% uh, of plutonium, but it's not well defined. Um, you can notice discrepancies between the data, even for the same plutonium content, and especially above 60% of plutonium. Uh, the melting temperature of PO2 was re-evaluated at uh, 3,017 Kelvin, it was in 2011 by uh, De Bricca uh, at GRC, and also by, uh, by Kato-san um, in Japan. But uh, it does still exist 200 Kelvin of deviations between these data, uh, as you can see on the figure, uh, mainly between um, uh, the blue point and uh, the red ones. Um, it's established that one source of the discrepancy is the stoichiometry, so the impact has to be evaluated. Uh, with the CALFAD tool, CALFAD is a, a thermochemistry tool, um, uh, we can uh, estimate uh, this melting temperature, but up to now it underestimates the solidus. Uh, the existing uh, low uh, for melting temperature should be revised following all these recent results and the correlation of the uh, melting temperature with the plutonium content and the stoichiometry is really uh, necessary. 
uh, we need uh, additional measurements, especially for high plutonium content, um, also in order to check the effect of the stoichiometry. And uh, we need to evaluate uh, the plutonium content for the lowest value of melting temperature. This is for uh, the safety analysis. So the next slide, please, on the thermal conductivity. The, the figure on the right upper side uh, describes the general trend of the lambda with the temperature. Uh, it's, it's composed with several contributions. Uh, the phony conduction due to the lattice um, and effective at low temperature. And then after 1200 Kelvin, uh, the electronic conduction uh, as well as the radiation are much more effective and uh, contribute to the increase of the global conductivity with the temperature. So I could spend two hours to explain all the different parameters impact on the lambda of the Mox fuel. Uh, you have just to remind that there is a strong effect of temperature, stoichiometry, plutonium content, density, and all the effects due to the radiation. Uh, this effect does explain the discrepancies between the data and also between uh, the different laws used for the lambda uh, in the different codes. The uncertainty associated with this low is quite high, uh, around 10% for the fresh fuel and uh, around 20% uh, for the irradiated one. Uh, and this uncertainty leads to an uncertainty of around uh, three, uh, of until 3000 Kelvin uh, for the maximum temperature of the, of the fuel. That's the reason why we have an intensive experimental program in Europe uh, with the measurements of uh, heat capacity, uh, diffusivity, and the associated uh, conductivity, but also on the melting temperature and uh, the thermal expansion. Uh, we need to cover uh, several plutonium content and several uh, burn-up. Uh, and this uh, has been uh, measured or will be measured uh, at GRC, uh, Karlsruhe, on the CA fuels, uh, in order to assess the formulations with the different effect of the input parameters. Here, uh, you can have an overview of this experimental program uh, with the different European projects involved, ESNI+, ESFR Smart, and uh, Puma. Uh, and we will try to cover uh, all the range of compositions and conditions. Uh, on the right side, uh, you can have uh, here uh, the first data of uh, thermal conductivity uh, performed on irradiated MOX fuel for fast reactors. Uh, so there is no large differences observed between the three investigated radial positions uh, we have a slight decrease of the thermal conductivity at the same temperature, uh, which is observed from the center of the pilot to the periphery, uh, which is associated to an increase of the burn-up and an increase of the plutonium content. So this thermal conductivity is higher than expected after this burn-up, and uh, we have several possible reasons. And I heard temperature during the irradiation that lead to less uh, damage effect, uh, a loss of most of the fission products that could affect the diffusivity, uh, like cesium, uh, an increase of the metallic fission products that enhance the conductivity, and less porosity, uh, mainly due to uh, the gas release. Uh, we are still working on the interpretation of this data. So next slide, please. So now uh, we will move on the fuel element design. Uh, we have seen that there is uh, uh, the main candidates uh, for advanced reactor are uh, carbide, metal, oxide, nitride, and so on. We can have several forms, fuel forms, single phase, solid solutions, or composites. Uh, and for the fuel packing, uh, it can take the form of pellet, which is a cylinder uh, with uh, uh, a central hole. 
uh, it means uh, annular pilet uh, or, or full pilet. Uh, we can have also a sphere pack uh, with uh, fuel particles. Uh, on the next slide, uh, we have a description of uh, the different uh, fuel elements foreseen for these uh, advanced reactors, um, starting with a very standard pin uh, fuel, uh, which is a, a cylinder made by uh, uh, cladding uh, and filled with a stack of uh, pellets. Uh, and the most innovative one uh, was a pin with uh, innovative cladding, here a composite six six fiber. It, it was mainly uh, uh, devoted to GFR and uh, the, the goal uh, is to improve uh, the, uh, um, its refractory cladding, so it's to improve the behavior uh, during uh, nominal and uh, off-normal conditions. And we can have uh, the additions with uh, this six uh, uh, fiber cladding of uh, uh, different coatings inside and outside in order to prevent from uh, uh, any reaction with the fuel and also in order to improve uh, the tightness. So next slide, please. Another kind of, of fuel element uh, is a standard peel, uh, pin uh, with uh, VIPAC or, or sphere pack fuels. Um, we have also, uh, it's mainly a forcing for uh, sodium fast reactors. Um, we can have also coated particles uh, forcing for VHTR um, and only possible for VHTR because of the the poor fissile density, and uh, we have developed also a plate type fuel uh, which was devoted to uh, the GFR, and the idea was uh, with the plate uh, to uh, increase the heat transfer and by this way to uh, compensate uh, the bad uh, heat conviction, convection of the uh, helium coolant. So next slide, please. So now the part two, uh, devoted to the fuel behavior and the radiation. So this slide, so we are on the slide 23. So this slide shows how complex is the fuel behavior during the irradiation. It results from the interaction of many phenomena. Moreover, the nuclear reactions, as well as the chemical reactions, leads to evolving materials of the fuel element. Chemical composition will change, as well as crystallography and properties. Uh, the conditions will also uh, change during the irradiation period, because uh, the geometry and the reactor operations are changing. So the system is even more complex because non cost, not constant uh, with the time. So next slide, please. So slide 24, uh, this uh, schematic representation of all uh, the phenomena that can occur on the microstructure of the MOX, uh, in, we, we, we have to notice that in several hours the fuel has completely changed in structure and compositions. So uh, we will detail uh, this phenomena that affect uh, the materials. Uh, you have uh, the schematic uh, descriptions on the left side and uh, a real cell ramography performed in the LECA facility uh, here in Cadrache in France uh, on a real uh, MOX fuel irradiated in the Phoenix uh, reactor. So we will detail the phenomena 
and uh, the effects on the modules. So next slide, please. 25. The original microstructure is destroyed on most of the pilot within hours and spread in four different areas, as you can see on the seromography. So you have on the, the, the right part, the central hole formation, uh, then the columnar grains, then the equiaxial grains, and finally the unrestructured zone. This is mainly due to the thermal gradient, which is the consequences of the high power and the low thermal conductivity. So the poor migration is due to the thermal gradient. The thermal gradient is around, uh, is even more, uh, it's even higher than 5,000 Kelvin per centimeter. And because also of the high temperature, higher than 2,000 Kelvin, uh, we will form a central hole early in the irradiation. In fact, the initial porosity resulting from the, the fuel pellet fabrication is homogeneously uh, distributed in the pellet, a small pores. But due to the very high summer level, these pores are redistributed along the radius through an evaporation condensation mechanism between the outside of, and the cold side of each pore, as you can see on the graph on the right side. So this matter movement contributes to the central hole formation and the columnar grain structure. The columnar grains of one millimeter long uh, in the central port are formed above 1,800 degrees. And the pore uh, migration as well as a high vapor pressure of uranium and plutonium above uh, this temperature leads to a redistribution of the plutonium content close to the central hole very early in the radiation. This increase is about 30% compared to the obtained value at the end of the fabrication. So this means that if you have 20% of plutonium at the fabrication, after several hours of irradiation close to the central hole, you can get 30% of plutonium. This is uh, very important to notice. Regarding uh, composition, the figure on the left side illustrates uh, the evolution of O over M. Uh, the, the stoichiometry decreases around the central hole and increases on the periphery of the pilot. Uh, the oxygen migration down uh, to the thermal gradient. Uh, the fuel is, uh, at the end of the fabrication, the fuel is slightly under stoichiometric, around 1.97. And uh, this oxygen redistribution is very fast because its diffusion velocity is very high. Uh, the oxygen migration is due to the solid phase transport and gaseous transport also. Uh, it, uh, if you have, for example, we have here uh, the example of uh, an initial stoichiometry of 1.97 at the end of fabrication, close to the central hole, you can get uh, 1.93 or 94, which is very low. We will see uh, the effect. When burn-up is uh, increasing, uh, fission is oxidizing and thus contributes to uh, the increase of the overrun. At, at a medium burn-up, uh, the stoichiometry is um, close to uh, 2.0 everywhere in the pilot. So next slide, please. Now we will speak about the fission projects. So each fission creates two fission projects uh, and the fission projects can, can be grouped in uh, into four uh, main categories. Uh, the fission projects in solution in the oxide matrix uh, in yellow, in the case of most of the lanthanides, uh, we have also the elements forming metallic precipitates in the case of molybdenum, technetium, ruthenium, palladium, well, it's in red, uh, and some others. 
Uh, we have also the elements forming separated oxide precipitates in the case of barium, uh, niobium, zirconium, uh, cesium, and uh, molybdenum. It's in blue. And uh, we have uh, some uh, uh, volatile uh, fission products, um, helium, xenon, krypton, uh, cesium, uh, in green. And a few, a few elements uh, like cesium, strontium, barium, molybdenum, uh, tellurium, and zirconium are marked uh, with mixed colors because they are distributed in different kinds of uh, phases. So the chemical uh, state uh, of the fuel depends uh, strongly on the oxygen chemical potential of the uh, MOX fuel. Uh, the, and, uh, and it increases during the irradiation. Uh, we have seen that the fission is oxidizing. Uh, as you can see here, the oxygen potential uh, is increasing uh, with uh, the burn up uh, from uh, the yellow um, uh, status after the fabrication until uh, the, the, the green curve uh, after 13 atom percent. Uh, we have a modification of uh, physical and chemical properties of the irradiated fuels due to these fission projects in solutions or under uh, different oxides precipitates or even under metallic uh, precipitates. We have also, uh, because of the uh, fission products diffusion, uh, the formation of uh, the jug, uh, the jug is a joint between the oxide and the cladding. You can see here on the ceramography uh, on, the, uh, on the figure in, in the left, uh, this is mainly compound uh, with uh, um, the molybdenate uh, of cesium uh, plus uh, other compounds. Uh, we can have also a fuel clad chemical interaction or corrosion uh, and it's a reaction between uh, some fission products uh, tellurium iodine cesium that reacts with um, the components of the cladding uh, mainly uh, iron uh, nickel and chromium in order to uh, um, to produce the cesium chromate uh, the iron telluride and uh, uh, the uh, also uh, nickel telluride. So next slide, please. Now we will see um, uh, each phenomenon uh, due to this uh, uh, effect of irradiation. So the slide 27. So we will see uh, each phenomenon and due to the irradiation and in particular the effect of neutrons and fission products uh, that could affect the performances of the MOX spin. So this slide is to illustrate that uh, due to uh, the neutron effect in combination with the temperature, uh, the cloud is swelling. Uh, and uh, uh, also, uh, we have an evolution of the mechanical property, properties of the clad uh, that can be affected. I have no time uh, to describe exactly all the phenomena in the cladding, uh, but this, this is uh, only one figure to illustrate, uh, in particular, the diametral uh, strain uh, due to uh, the swelling induced by the neutron. Um, it's a strain. Uh, as a function of the actual positions of the pin. Our preference is clearly to have a stainless steel uh, that have demonstrated a low level of, of swelling, uh, like uh, the austenitic uh, 1515. So next slide. The clad is also affected by a chemical interaction with the fuel named FCCI or corrosion. Uh, which leads to reduce the thickness of the tube. Uh, the interaction is mainly, uh, as we have seen, uh, with steric, cesium, and iodine. Uh, it depends clearly on the initial overram of the fuel uh, that has to be high uh, for the thermal properties, but not so high for these corrosion issues. 
So that's the reason why the target value uh, for the fabrication is um, 1.97 to 1.98 and not the stoichiometry. So the evaluation of such a, a corrosion by some fission products can be done through uh, thermodynamic studies of the interface between the fuel and the plaid. Uh, and uh, uh, the temperature, we have to say that the temperature threshold for the corrosion attack uh, on the cladding is around uh, 500 degrees, uh, but it's also depending on, uh, uh, on the fuel, as I said, and especially on the stoichiometry. The maximum value seen is uh, 200 microns, uh, which represent 40% uh, of the clad thickness. So you can expect that the performance reductions due to the, the risk of failure uh, with a thinner clad, uh, which was, uh, and uh, uh, this thinner clad submitted to uh, uh, pressure and creep uh, could be, um, could have a risk of uh, failure uh, only due to this uh, corrosion. So next slide, please. 29. So in parallel, uh, we have some fission projects like cesium or molybdenum that diffuse until uh, the clad pilot gap uh, to form uh, the, the, the so-called joint oxide uh, joint or jug uh, in French, sorry, uh, composed with uh, several fission projects uh, to form oxide. So mainly is CS2MO4 and CS4MO7. So the, the jug can reach uh, 160 microns of thickness uh, in the case of low clad strain. But it's even larger if the cladding uh, swells much more. So it will lead to an improvement of uh, uh, the thermal behavior of the pin. Uh, with a, a, a quite low thermal conductivity, but much higher uh, than a gap filled only with gas. Uh, uh, a reduction of several uh, hundred kelvins uh, is expected in the fuel, uh, thanks to the good conductance of the jug in the gap. So we have observed that jug formation starts around seven atom percent, and uh, we assume that there is no mechanical effect. Uh, because it's uh, a plastic material with uh, an actual extrusion uh, in the gap. So next slide, please. So now considering uh, the fuel gaseous swelling uh, on the curve, uh, representing the retention of fission gases in the fuel, uh, it's noted that on the central part of the pilot, uh, where we have the maximum temperature, all the gases are released, while in the peripheral part of the uh, pilot, uh, the lowest uh, temperature reduces the gas diffusions. Uh, under fast neutron conditions, we reach uh, more than 80% of gas release for the whole pin. We have several uh, experimental devices uh, that uh, does exist to measure uh, the gas retention uh, in the fuel and to evaluate the gaseous swelling. Um, this is uh, uh, some uh, pictures uh, with the device we have uh, at the LECA facility um, on the irradiated fuel, uh, EPMA, in order to see uh, the gas dissolve at the uh, submicronic uh, level. Uh, the seams uh, for um, the total gas, uh, the, the term uh, for the gas bubble, and uh, the map fib uh, to see in three dimensions the shape, the shape of the gas bubbles. And we have to add uh, that uh, with uh, heat treatment, uh, we can get the final inventory uh, of these gases. So next slide, please. Another important uh, effect of radiation damage uh, is the solid uh, swelling uh, of the fuel material. 
This is due to the increase of the number of atoms inside of the fuel with burn up, uh, and this uh, leads to the increase of the fuel volume. Uh, as two fission products atoms are created, when one heavy atom is consumed, uh, the uh, total number of atoms is increasing. Uh, so uh, we uh, explain on this figure uh, that uh, uh, we have a, a linear dependence of the uh, solid swelling with the burn up. Um, it's, it has been evaluated to 0.6% by atom percent, which is very, uh, very low compared to the other fuels. So next slide, please. So very quickly, because I spoke about the properties, uh, all the mechanical and thermal properties are affected by the radiation. Uh, not only by the uh, fission products inclusion, uh, but also uh, with the disorder in the structure due, the fission, due to the fission reactions and the recoil uh, of the products, but also due to the neutron effects. Uh, we have also to take into account the evolution of composition, stoichiometry, and density um, on these uh, properties. And we have uh, several. Um, device in order to evaluate uh, this uh, damage uh, coming from the irradiation, especially the TEM. So next slide, please, on the thermal behavior of the fuel element. Now a description of the rich temperature in the fuel element. Um, so first, uh, the purpose of this assessment is uh, to predict the clad and the fuel temperature uh, with all the evolutions we have just listed. Uh, so, the, uh, toward the actual uh, temperature. Uh, first, the actual temperature profile results from the linear heat rate actual profile uh, with a maximum named the max flux plane close to the mid plane and, uh, of the core. Uh, the actual the fuel temperature in green uh, follows uh, this linear heat rate profile. Uh, for sodium fast reactors, the circulating coolant uh, from bottom to the top of the pin will heat of about 150 degrees in contact with uh, the hot uh, fuel elements. Uh, the clad temperature in uh, dark blue uh, will actually increase from about uh, 400 degrees up to uh, 600 degrees at the top. Uh, towards the radial uh, temperature uh, distribution, uh, the radial profile temperature across the pilot uh, is due to the low thermal conductivity of the fuel and the small gap conductance. So the oxide fuel operates at relatively uh, high temperature. Uh, we have uh, 1,200 uh, Kelvin in the outer part of the pilot uh, and 2,400 Kelvin in the center part. Uh, this, this means that the thermal gradient, as I said before, is uh, higher than 5,000 Kelvin per centimeter. So these temperatures decrease after some days, um, and uh, we start with the blue curve, uh, and uh, after uh, the opening of the central hole, uh, we have the green curve uh, with the temperature uh, lower of about uh, 300 degrees. Uh, the, the, and then, well, when the gap is closed, the temperature is even lower. It's a pink uh, curve. So the safety analysis uh, with the evaluation of the margin to melt is achieved all along the irradiation, but the highest temperature reached during the beginning of the irradiation is, uh, is reached during the beginning of the irradiation. So this is an advantage because the thermal conductivity is not yet affected by the irradiation. So the uncertainties on the properties is uh, the, the lowest. So next slide, please, on the mechanical behavior of the fuel element. So regarding to the mechanical behavior, uh, the objective is really to predict the dimensional uh, changes, such as the clad strain or the closure of the gap. Uh, it's also to predict the risk of clad failure in both nominal and uh, incidental conditions. Uh, the evaluation of the mechanics of the fuel element is an important element toward the, the reactor safety as the clad is the first uh, safety barrier. 
the mechanical ph phenomena to learn uh, for the fuel. Uh, it's first the swelling, the creep, the mechanical properties, uh, the cracking due to the very high thermal gradient uh, with differential uh, thermal expansion. Uh, and we have also to take into account the relocation of the fragments uh, that can enhance uh, the heat transfer. Uh, for the plug, uh, it will be taken into account the swelling at high dose, uh, the creep, uh, the embrittlement, and the evolution of the properties during irradiations, like uh, the elastic limit, as we can see on the figure, uh, and it's lower after uh, the irradiation than on the fresh fuel. So next slide, please. Uh, still on the mechanical behavior. Uh, we have seen that uh, we have two main fin mechanical phenomena uh, observed. Uh, the first is a clad pilot mechanical interaction, uh, which is controlled by, by a rel relatively uh, low uh, oxide uh, swelling rate due to uh, high fuel temperature, uh, which by uh, thermal creeps uh, leads to non-rigid behavior towards the structural material. Uh, also because of the jug formation uh, that acts as a, an elastic seal uh, without a stress uh, transmission. Uh, finally, uh, the design of the fuel element uh, contributes to avoid this interaction, uh, this mechanical interaction, with a smear density adapted to the evolution of each of the materials uh, with the performances request. Uh, this means that uh, we will have to adapt the smear density depending on the burn-up you want to reach. Concerning the chemi uh, chemical interaction between the fuel and the clad, uh, named the uh, FCCI, uh, it leads to reduce the thickness of the tube and thus limit the burn-up. So FCCI may be evaluated uh, with uh, efficient products diffusions and the thermodynamics of the interface. Uh, the the R&D on clad materials as a goal to develop corrosion resistant stainless steel in order to prevent from uh, uh, damaging uh, corrosion. So next slide, please. Concerning uh, the behavior of MOX fuel under transients, uh, first of all, we have to select the relevant accidental scenario that depends strongly on the core design and the reactor system. Here we have the main types of accident. Uh, so an ex unexpected control road uh, withdrawal, which is a low power transient, uh, unprotected uh, transient of power, which is a, a fast power transient. We have also unprotected uh, loss of flow. Um, uh, and finally, we have uh, the possible total uh, inter instantaneous assembly inlet blockage. Um, and uh, uh, for all these scenarios, uh, we have to say that the behavior um, is uh, strongly dependent to the core design and the reactor system. So I will not present any results uh, because as I said, it's dependent on the core, uh, on the pin design, uh, but also uh, on the different uh, safety device in order to prevent uh, from severe accidents. Uh, it's uh, we, we call the, uh, this device complementary safety uh, devices. So the experimental uh, data acquisition is made uh, from separated uh, effects or integral tests. Uh, we had the test of sing single uh, road in the Cabri uh, safety reactor here in, uh, in, in France, in Calarache, or the test of a fuel bundle uh, in the Scarabe um, uh, facility. Uh, the feedback uh, does uh, exist uh, mainly from uh, uh, the safety reactors, Cabri, Trit, but some other in the world. Uh, like you can see on this table, uh, we have the list of the different uh, tests uh, in the uh, Cabri uh, reactor. Uh, there are numerous on the oxide pin for fast reactors uh, under different conditions of transient. Uh, part of this test has been launched uh, through international agreements 
and provided a lot of uh, valuable results. Uh, for example, on the right side, you can see a seromography of MOX fuel after a fast power transient with a, a super phoenix uh, design with 85% uh, uh, of the radius uh, that have been uh, melt. Nevertheless, this kind of test uh, is still uh, low and expensive. Uh, and uh, in, in the same time, a large panel of scenarios uh, and uncertainties still exist. So we need to develop um, simulation codes uh, in order to take into account all uh, the complex interactions between the different phenomena and also to cover all the safety uh, situations. So next slide, please. This is uh, the next slide is devoted to the a summary of uh, all uh, the descriptions uh, uh, I have explained on the behavior of the on the microstructure, uh, the thermomechanical and the thermochemical behavior. As I have not so many times, I propose to go to the part three uh, devoted to the fuel element performances, uh, the design and the qualifications. So the slide 39. So there is a vast experience of using uh, MOX fuel in fast reactors uh, with a high burn-up reach. Uh, 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 I will not uh, detail the, the, this past experience with all the reactors um, from uh, uh, the 50s uh, up to now um, uh, of fast reactors filled with uh, uh, MOX fuel or MOX driver fuel or experimental uh, MOX fuel. So uh, the, the table here gathers um, the, uh, the main results uh, we get uh, recently and especially uh, in, the, uh, in the recent uh, sodium fast reactors. Uh, so uh, we reach uh, um, until 20 uh, atom percent uh, for the burn up. Uh, a dose of uh, 155 dPa and uh, the highest uh, uh, linear heat rate was uh, uh, 550 watt per centimeter. Several accidental tests have been also carried out, as we have seen, uh, and reprocessing have been tested at industrial uh, scale uh, on these irradiated fuels. So performances, uh, so uh, the fast reactor in operations uh, now, so it's uh, mainly uh, in Russia, BOR-60, uh, BN-600 and uh, BN-800 uh, with uh, uh, MOX driver fuel, not only, but uh, uh, part of the core is loaded with uh, MOX fuel. Uh, and also uh, in the case for the Joyo reactor in Japan, and uh, we hope that uh, before the end of the, uh, of the year, uh, in India, we will have the PFBR uh, loaded with uh, MOX fuel. So next slide, please. Um, during uh, all this experience, we have improved the fuel element design. And the improvement uh, were mainly devoted to the geometry, uh, especially the annular pilet. Uh, because uh, of the uh, safety uh, improvement um, during nominal conditions uh, and also under transients in order to avoid the fuel melting, um, we choose the annular pilot. A large pin uh, diameter has also been developed, uh, actually heterogeneous pin also for safety improvement. Uh, we have a large range of composition uh, not only uh, with the uranium, but also for the plutonium. We can take into account in a fast reactor uh, from 15 to 45% uh, 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 of plutonium uh, with several grades. And uh, we have demonstrated that the minor actinide transmutations is possible under different ways, diluted in the drive fuel or uh, in dedicated fuels like uh, targets or uh, blankets. Uh, towards the specifications of the fuel, it's mastered uh, with several uh, fabrication processes. It's adapted to industrial fabrication 
and it does respond to uh, safety issues. So the next slide, please. Uh, for towards the fuel element qualification. So uh, the objective for 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 the qualification is to get the licensing. Uh, the licensing is the authorization from the safety authorities. Uh, to load this fuel element in nuclear power plants. Uh, the requirements are coming uh, from uh, the guidance, uh, the regulatory, regulatory uh, guidance, um, which uh, uh, ask for an higher level of safety, uh, a qualification of computa computational tools. It's not possible to provide only experimental results. Uh, the tools are also evaluated and the uncertainties of both experimental uh, tests and uh, the fuel performance codes uh, consist uh, the uncertainties uh, of both um, must be consistent with the safety margins uh, the criteria uh, for the safety authorities are mainly uh, maintaining the cladding integrity as it's uh, the first barrier uh, the coolable geometry and limiting the uh, impact, uh, the radiological uh, impact. Uh, the fuel failure, as well as the fuel uh, degradation, like uh, melting, have to be uh, identified and controlled. So now, uh, towards the fuel element qualifications. Uh, so uh, the essential part for the fuel qualification is to define a uh, test envelope to cover uh, expected uh, conditions uh, transients and accidental conditions to assess the fuel performance and to validate also the fuel performance codes. Uh, I have no time to explain how uh, we applied uh, the, the, the initial um, uh, technological readiness uh, level uh, to uh, the nuclear fuel elements because uh, this scale uh, came from the NASA and was applied to uh, the nuclear uh, licensing. So um, here you have on the left side uh, the descriptions uh, of the, um, the, 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 the content of each level of the scale from the one to the nine. At nine, you get uh, the licensing. And on the right uh, part, uh, this scale was applied to the fuel element. Um, so we, for it's described what you have to provide for each step, uh, from uh, one to to from the the level one uh, to the two. It's a selection phase. Uh, the three to the four, it's development. Uh, so mainly R and D. And uh, at uh, the level four uh, starts uh, the test for the qualifications. So you can see here that between four to five, uh, we have some tests at the pilot or, 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 or pin uh, scale uh, with out of pile test. Uh, then uh, from the level five to six, uh, we have to test under representative uh, conditions with the representative uh, composition and geometry. This means at the pin level. Uh, from the six to seven, uh, it takes some, uh, into account all uh, the conditions, including off normal. Uh, and from seven to nine, uh, we start the licensing uh, with a demonstration of several sub-assembly uh, until uh, a whole core loaded uh, with this new fuel. You have this reference if you want to have more details uh, on this uh, TRL uh, application for uh, the fuel element qualification. So next slide, 43. This is a tentative of description of MOX qualification uh, for the different advanced systems. Uh, we put as parameters uh, the, the plutonium content and the linear heat rate. Uh, but uh, we could add the pin design and the burn up in order to be uh, very complete. Uh, we can just uh, say that for compositions uh, between uh, 18 to 28 um, percent of plutonium uh, with a conventional phoenix geometry, uh, even with central hole or a super phoenix type, uh, the qualification was fully achieved, including. Uh, at an industrial uh, scale for the fabrication. Uh, 
um, and the whole core uh, were tested uh, until 13 atom percent uh, with different uh, safety tests. It was for the SFR. For the other systems um, that have different compositions or different conditions, the qualification level is uh, lower. Is the case, for example, for uh, the GFR and also for the LFR. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have seen that the behavior of the MOX fuel is well known uh, with phenomena identified as well as the coupling effect. So during a qualification process, uh, it's not possible to provide experimental only experimental results uh, for all the possible conditions during normal and off-normal situations. That's the reason why uh, we need tools to predict uh, the pin behavior. Uh, the name of this kind of codes uh, is fuel performance code, as it provides the performances of the fuel element. Uh, performances meaning thermomechanical and chemical behavior in order to make uh, an evaluation towards safety criteria on the fuel and the cladding. So uh, this tool is a combination uh, of different components dedicated first on material evolution, uh, then on thermal analysis, uh, on mechanical evaluation, on physical chemistry, uh, mainly with the fission gases, uh, diffusion and release. Uh, then uh, we have a component on thermochemistry calculations, uh, mainly to um, reach the chemical form of all the species. Um, in order and the combinations of all these components uh, can predict uh, the, all the effects we have seen. Uh, I have to say uh, for the material evolutions on the left part uh, that several scales uh, are used for the prediction of damage and properties evolutions uh, from the atomistic uh, modeling up to uh, very uh, representative elementary volume that take into account uh, not only uh, the compositions but also uh, the microstructure like like uh, grain um, grain size and uh, grain boundaries and uh, uh, porosities and the shape of porosity. So. Uh, and you have here uh, these references uh, if you want to have more details on the fuel performance codes because I had no time to explain uh, exactly uh, the content of this kind of tools. So as a next slide please, uh, now the, the, the conclusion. So the slide 46. So if we summarize, uh, the oxide fuel is able to achieve high burn-up uh, and even very high burn-up, 20 atom percent. The limit is due mainly to structural materials, namely the cladding and the hexagonal tube. Uh, a high thermal creep because of the high temperature and the optimized design lead to avoid the fuel uh, cladding mechanical interaction. We also note a very high melting temperature uh, a stable and isotropic structure and the low uh, uh, swelling. Uh, however, chemical interaction of the fuel with the sodium in case of clad failure has to be managed as well as the cor corrosion generated on the clad uh, at high burn up. So uh, we have uh, uh, a compatibility uh, with the stainless steel uh, and the cladding. Uh, we have a large feedback on safety tests. Um, the fuel performance codes are numerous and qualified on a set of reliable uh, experimental tests. I had no time to explain that uh, the fuel performance codes are uh, associated with uh, databases uh, with a lot of uh, irradiation results uh, performed in the fast reactors and not only, also in uh, material testing reactors in order to test uh, different uh, irradiation conditions. Uh, the, uh, the manufacturing and reprocessing process are very similar to light water reactor. 
uh, this is a, an advantage because uh, we take into account the large experience uh, on uh, Pido Rouen and uh, with uh, the existing facilities. Uh, Towards the fuel cycle, um, we have a, a well known fabrication process and a large experience on the reprocessing on uh, uh, the MOX fuel. Uh, Towards the different uh, scenario, uh, the fuel cycle scenario, uh, so this uh, advanced reactor associated with the MOX fuel uh, are very flexible towards the plutonium management, uh, taking into account both the plutonium content and the gray, uh, but also towards the uranium use and the high capabilities for uh, minor actinide uh, transmutations. So next slide, please. On the, the perspective for the R&D, I would like to present uh, the uh, the R&D uh, still needed on the MOX pins. On the fuel materials, uh, the property measurement is an important element because it impacts uh, directly on reducing the uncertainty um, on the results uh, coming from the fuel performance codes. Uh, the development are also underway to manage different fuel compositions and thus to adapt uh, all the options of transition scenario of the park. So mainly, as we have seen, uh, plutonium uh, and isotopy. So we have uh, to uh, um, enlarge uh, the range of composition. Regarding the cladding materials, the achievement of high doses and the resistance to corrosion is a priority uh, for the R&D program. Finally, uh, the trend of pin design uh, would be to increase the pin diameter uh, in order to reduce the coolant volume and the volume of structural materials. And uh, uh, large diameters are also uh, associated with annular pellet in order to reduce the maximum temperature uh, during all the conditions. Uh, improvements are also needed on modeling and simulation in order to be more predictive uh, and to answer to the safety requirements for a reduction of experimental uh, demonstration. An assessment uh, of the uh, pin behavior during the incidental uh, and accidental scenario uh, is also needed uh, one more time for uh, the uh, validation of the uh, uh, fuel performance codes. So uh, this is uh, the end of my talk. I just want to mention the different sources uh, I used. Uh, so, uh, first of all, several books dedicated to uh, uh, the fuel behavior for advanced reactor. Uh, you will find not only uh, the oxide, but also the metal, uh, carbide, and uh, nitride uh, in these books. Uh, you have some uh, international courses or, or schools, um, some conferences, uh, the, the, the fast reactor conferences are devoted uh, not only uh, to the core but also to all the components of the core uh, including uh, the fuel. Uh, you have also the global conferences devoted to the fuel cycle and dedicated com conferences like, uh, workshop like uh, IEMPT devoted to partitioning and transmutation but also uh, con workshop like NUMAT devoted to uh, the behavior of the different materials and Atalant devoted um, to uh, the reprocessing. Uh, we have current international activity on the oxide, but also on the other fuels. Uh, at OECD, we have an expert group on innovative fuel, fuel elements, uh, where we are performing benchmark exercise, and uh, we will intend this year to provide recommendations for uh, fuel uh, properties uh, on MOX fuel and metal fuel. At IEA, uh, we have started last year uh, a CRP on fuels and materials for fast reactor, and uh, we want to share uh, experimental irradiations in order to uh, increase um, uh, the, the data, uh, the validation database uh, for the codes. Uh, in the GIF, uh, we have devoted uh, management project management board uh, for each system. Uh, speaking about uh, the fuel and the fuel element. And, uh, 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 and uh, also we have some European projects 
uh, I have mentioned for uh, especially uh, the uh, properties measurements. And we have, uh, it's very interesting to have a look on the databases. At IEA, we have SARPRO dedicated to uh, fuel properties. At OECD, we have uh, TAF-ID, uh, which is a database devoted to thermochemistry uh, data. And also at OECD, we have the uh, IEFPE database devoted to uh, irradiation results uh, for the validation. And uh, that's the end uh, of my talk. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, did you have anything you wanted to talk about the prototypes and industrial SFR graphic? Oh, yes, it was the final slide. <laughs> it was just an overview of the different uh, uh, prototypes or industrial uh, fast reactors in the world. So. Great, thank you very much. So and if you have more comments. Questions, go ahead and type them into the questions box. Um, while those questions are coming in, we'll take a quick look at the upcoming webinar presentations in February, an overview of the waste treatment plant Hanford site. In March, introducing new plant design code. And in April, a presentation on the experience of HTTR licensing for Japan's new nuclear regulation. And I'd like to give Patricia just a moment um, to talk about the Pitch Your Gen 4 research. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Berta. I uh, would like uh, to invite you as the chair of the Gen4 International Forum Education and Training Working Group um, to look at this uh, event. Uh, it's, uh, we are hosting an exciting competition for the young uh, researchers. Um, they, they will be asked, uh, if you are interested, uh, you will be asked to submit a one-page um, executive summary in a research related to Gen4 uh, advanced nuclear energy system, and the jury will select up to the 25 uh, outstanding research projects, um, and uh, they will be asked to present a three-minute uh, video pitch. So um, please uh, spread uh, the word out. Uh, we are very exciting with this uh, Pitch Your Gen 4 research competition. You have the uh, flyer in the handout box, and thank you again for spreading the word. We will start to open um, the competition on the 1st of February, next Monday. Thank you. Thank you. There are several questions that have been posted. Um, do you see the the, the questions, yeah. Natalie? The first. Yeah, the first one. Uh, so the first question is, what do you think of vented uh, fuel pin designs? Well, um, uh, in the design we have of fast of uh, sodium fast reactors, uh, the p the the cladding acts as the first safety barrier. So uh, with vented uh, fuel pins, uh, it's no more the first barrier. Uh, so, uh, uh, well, towards the safety issues, I'm not convinced that, uh, for example, in France, uh, we could be allowed to uh, uh, choose this kind of design. The second question is, is a metallic fuel better, the, uh, better than uh, oxide or mixed oxide? Well, uh, it's different to compare because uh, uh, the oxide fuel, we had a maturity on the oxide fuel because uh, we have developed uh, an industrial process for the fabrication, for example, and for the reprocessing. So uh, this could be one reason for um, the difficulty to move to uh, the metal fuel. But uh, metal fuel is very interesting um, because uh, uh, some uh, uh, performances are, are very good, and uh, um, the metallic fuel most of the time are chosen for uh, the doubling time, uh, which is
Did I lose you? So I'm not uh, exactly sure where we were when when we lost you. Um, you lost me on, on the metal, the comparison between metal and oxide. Okay, if metal, great. If the, if the metal um, fuel is uh, better than the oxide. Well, uh, the, my answer was, uh, well, uh, the, um, uh, we knew uh, the oxide fuel as it had been tested uh, at a, an industrial scale, especially for fabrication, the reprocessing, but not only, uh, we had several uh, fast reactors uh, with a driver fuel, uh, with MOX fuel. Um, so we have a, a very large feedback. Uh, the metal fuel is very interesting, with very interesting uh, characteristic, and it reached uh, high performances, especially in burn up. Uh, as far as I know, uh, the, the main issue now is to reduce uh, the interaction between uh, the fuel and the cladding. Uh, and the other point is to test at an industrial scale uh, the fabrication and the reprocessing. Uh, most of the, the, the countries that I have chosen uh, the metal fuel as uh, the objective for the future is mainly um, for the performances, but not only uh, because it's very comparable to the oxide. It's uh, mainly uh, due to the uh, doubling time. Uh, which is higher for the uh, metal fuel. So uh, the next question is um, there is no more questions. The other questions was uh, if it's possible to have uh, the slides. I think it's okay. Yes, yes. So there's a question considering that SFR fuel would be reprocessed, why do you target such high burn-up level, 13 to 15%? Yes, uh, we have tested uh, this kind of fuel, and uh, uh, but uh, with uh, a quite standard plutonium content. Uh, in the coming uh, year, uh, we will test the reprocessing on a high plutonium content, uh, for example, uh, uh, more than 40% of plutonium because there is an issue towards the uh, reprocessing. So it's uh, within uh, the uh, Puma European project. Thank you. So are you able to see the questions in the question pane? Um, how much of the SFR MOX fuel knowledge and technical readiness level are applicable to LFR? Uh, so, uh, the, 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 we get a quite high, le high level of TRL uh, for MOX fuel under SFR conditions. Uh, this means that uh, for Phoenix or, 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 or Phoenix with a central hole, uh, which is the case, uh, for example, for the uh, Russian reactors and also for the Indian reactors, uh, we, we get a, a, a TRL of uh, between uh, 8 to 9. Uh, with different uh, design or compositions, the TRL is lower. Uh, for the elephant, uh, as far as I know, uh, they want to, to have a lower linear heat rate and uh, higher plutonium content. Uh, so probably uh, the TRL level is lower. Uh, we have to check, but uh, I don't know for this kind of compositions if we have uh, some safety test, for example, uh, in order to reach the TRL6. Thank you. The question, there's a question, Max Fuel seems to be very beneficial, but appears that this leads to increased substantiation time. Do you think that this time requirement prohibitively hinders Gen 4 development? I cannot see this question, please, where it is. Um, the, there should be a pane labeled questions. Yes. Um, let me...
it's um, oh, yeah. oh, see. um Um, well, it takes the development of this kind of fuel uh, takes time. Uh, so, uh, well, it's depending on the condition. It's very difficult to answer because it's really depending to the condition of use. But uh, most of the time, we need more than ten to fifteen years to achieve a, a qualification. So uh, the next question is, okay, some references uh, for potential uh, fuel types uh, like standard pin with VIPAC or sphere pack. Yes, there is some tech doc at IEA. If you if you go to uh, the uh, the website of IEA, uh, you could find uh, some tech doc report devoted to uh, uh, these different design and the performances reached, for example, with uh, VIPAC or sphere pack. And you have also a publication from uh, our Russian colleagues. Uh, with uh, the experimental test uh, achieved in the uh, BOR60 on this kind of special design. Uh, the next question is, how do you expect the effect of cauliflower structure at a very high burn-up, higher than 10%? Uh, um, so, uh, cauliflower what is this uh, i don't know excuse me but i don't know uh, this cauliflower uh, this uh, uh, this name of effect um, if it's a, a kind of a rim structure uh, that we can have in pwr or mox fuel uh, we have seen in a fast reactor and uh, for example, uh, three years ago on uh, Neston uh, samples irradiated in the Phoenix reactor, uh, we have observed this kind of structure and uh, uh, we have seen uh, the, uh, the, the, the small grains. The main questions now, and we don't have the answer, is uh, the effect of this structure, uh, for example, on the thermal and mechanical properties. We have an idea for PWR. But for fast reactor, uh, we need to check because uh, we have also to take into account uh, the redistribution of the species in this area. So the next question is, I noticed that the recycling option is not included in your uh, validation uh, slide. Does it mean for the SFR speed reactor, it would be limited to uh, one through cycle only, or is there uh, validation data already available? Yes, you know that uh, in France we are working on uh, the recycle options and uh, inside of the requirement uh, we have uh, the recycling uh, requirements. So uh, uh, and we have a lot of we had a lot of results because uh, for example uh, in the Marcoul center uh, we had uh, a facility devoted to the recycling of the Phoenix plant fuel. Uh, so, uh, uh, we have a lot of results uh, on this topic, but now uh, we are wondering not only on the multi-recycling of the spent fuel coming from uh, uh, the own fast reactors, but also um, from the, uh, coming from uh, the spent fuel of PWR. And for example, the multi-recycling of plutonium uh, is one, on, uh, one option uh, to use uh, the plutonium. So the next question is, is the versatile test reactor, uh, if the versatile uh, test reactor uh, were built in the US, what test of MOX fuel uh, 
uh, would you recommend to perf to be performed only um, or if any? Uh, yes. Uh, as I said, uh, we, we still need experimental tests. And in this kind of experimental reactor uh, with uh, fast uh, spectrum, um, probably we will have some needs, uh, especially uh, for the validation of some models uh, at the beginning of life, but not only. Uh, and it's quite important in this kind of experimental uh, reactors uh, to achieve uh, some, uh, uh, not only transient tests, but uh, tests for of normal conditions. And this is what we need for the validation of our code. Okay. The next question is, uh, what is the compensation of plutonium-239 required uh, for each time of recycling to achieve same power output? Uh, the compensation is the plutonium content. Uh, you need to increase the plutonium content. That's the reason why, if you want to uh, multi-recycle the plutonium uh, with a, a, a quite low grade, uh, you need to, to go to until 30 to uh, uh, 32 or even 34% of plutonium. That's the reason why we are interested now uh, in a higher uh, plutonium content. Uh, yes, that's the answer. Uh, so, next question is um, Could you please explain why gas fission projects won't exist in the internal zone of MOX Pilat? Uh, in slide uh, 28. So, the slide 28. Um, well, uh, it's because uh, in, in this slide, uh, it's the behavior uh, very uh, at the beginning of the irradiation. The idea was to explain on this slide uh, the, the, all the phenomena that occur during uh, the first hours. That's the reason why we don't have any uh, fission gases on this slide. So next question is, um, are there potential alternatives to sodium for sodium bonding in metallic fuels? Um, most repository do not allow for sodium to be di disposed of in them and, and sodium treatment is required, yes, uh, but it's not simple to perform, so an alter alternative would be preferred. Um, I, I don't know, uh, but uh, some other uh, metals uh, have been uh, uh, studied, uh, but at the end and very early in the 60s and 70s, uh, the sodium bond was chosen. Um, and as far as I know, there is no more R&D on other bonds. So I guess that it's because uh, of the compatibility, the good compatibility between uh, the sodium and the metal fuel. How do you use TRL a kind of map uh, for the next challenging construction of the fast reactor? That's a good question. TRL are now applied on all uh, the different components of a reactor. So uh, I have just illustrated the application of TRL on fuel element, but it's also possible for, 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 for all the core. Uh, so I, I don't know uh, if it's done or not. Uh, I have to say that at OECD, in most of the expert groups, we are trying to apply this uh, scale uh, because uh, uh, it's quite easy to explain uh, the level of maturity uh, for the different uh, components. Uh, but uh, I don't know for a wall construction if uh, it has been done uh, or not. Okay, 
How do you use Torium matrix to improve MOXU performance? Or you do not seem to use uh, Sorium at all? Um, yes, it's depending on the resources you have. Uh, Torium uh, has uh, different issues, and especially uh, toward the fuel cycle. Uh, and uh, uh, in all the cases, I understood, I'm not specialist in Torium, but uh, um, I understood that uh, in all the cases uh, you have to uh, to to start uh, with uh, uh, uranium uh, in order to produce plutonium uh, in order to start a core uh, because uh, it's not possible to achieve it directly uh, only with thorium. So um, well, we are not in this case in France. Uh, so uh, uh, and as we have a, a very long experience. Uh, on uh, uranium and uh, MOX fuel, uh, we use uh, MOX fuel. What are the advantages of metallic fuel during severe accidents? Uh, corium handling in, the ve in a vessel phase. It's difficult to answer th to these questions and the comparison of, um, uh, of oxide cores uh, with metal, fuel, uh, metal cores uh, under severe accidents, um, it's not in my uh, in my field uh, of skills. So, uh, uh, but I know that there is an expert group at OECD uh, who are dealing uh, with uh, the comparison of these uh, both scores under transients and severe accidents. The only way, in the only thing that I, I can uh, answer. Thank you so much, Natalie, and I apologize for the technical issues that we experienced um, at the beginning with the delay. Uh, I think we overcame that well, though. Your presentation was wonderful. You can tell the level of engagement from the number of people who hung, hung through this Q&A while we disconnected. We still have 67 people listening to your responses, so great, great job. Thank you very much for sharing your expertise. And thanks to the audience members who stuck with us. I don't see any more questions that have come in. No, no more. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, thank you to the audience uh, and uh, hope that uh, uh, we will have the opportunity uh, to meet each other, for example, in uh, international conferences or um, in uh, some uh, international instance uh, in order to have more in-depth discussions uh, on the field. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nathalie, again. Thank you, Bertha. Bye-bye. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.